So good morning, everybody. Uh, you have just been let into this webinar. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear us. And otherwise, please use the chat if you have any technical problems and we will try to help you. Uh, so welcome. We, uh, uh, what you will hear today is uh, some experiences from a project which is made in collaboration with the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. So we have a Nordic, um, Nordic perspective of this project. And it's uh, also a part of the Nordic Council of Ministers action plan for vision 2030, which runs up to uh, 2024. Uh, <clears throat> and the topic of today is uh, what I think many of you who are participating today is thinking of now and then. Uh, it's namely how to create acceptance for measures that lead to the climate goals in a municipality or a region. <clears throat> and we have seen and we surely know there is a pos positive attitude towards uh, certain uh, to, to reduce the climate impact. But uh, when it comes to concrete measures, when it's presented, when it's tried to be done, sometimes you meet mm, obstacles or uh, opposition. Uh, and this is what we're going to discuss today. So um, we have aspects of the dialogue process and how these visions can be conveyed, how we are building confidence uh, on our topics and the role of municipality and regions in this work. And of course, how we, how we can use policy instruments to reach our goals. So today you will hear six presentations. Um, I want you not to write your chat thoughts or questions during the presentations because we want to listen to them. And you will have short time after each presentation to write a comment or a, or a question. Uh, and I will ask you present, presenters to, to keep your time, maximum 10 minutes if we are going to do this, and then you will have some minutes afterwards for, for questions. My name is Mats Ola Larsson. I'm working at the IVL Swedish Environmental Research Institute and I'm um, positioned in Göteborg, but we, we have also colleagues in Stockholm participating and doing this. And you will meet one of my colleagues later on. So um, this is my introduction and uh, I don't want to talk anymore. Well, we are at least supposed to be 40, 50 participants. You can see it in the list somewhere if you're curious, I suppose. And um, we will continue until roughly 11 o'clock. Uh, we will have a short break in some, somewhere in the middle. So the first of our speakers today is uh, Laura Ina from the city of Tampere in Finland. Are you with us? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. <laughs> uh, it's like um, it, it's it's a very good sound. So you, and we can see you well. So <laughs> you're welcome to start your presentation. And I won't talk anymore. It's better you to describe what you do and your your part in this project. Please. Sounds great, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Laura Inha and I'm the development manager of our city's climate and environmental policy unit. And while I'm presenting myself, I see if I can, let's see if I can um, also share the screen. Do you see uh, the presentation? Perfect. Let's get into it so that we don't overuse the time. Um, I will talk more about the citizen engagement and acceptance, but before that, I will just spend two minutes on, on what we done at the municipality level in the city organization, because uh, I feel it's important background uh, in terms of setting the states for civil uh, citizen engagement. I feel like we as a city organization have to give an example and show that we are doing our part first. And um, to summarize really, really concretely and shortly, the key steps to create a climate engagement at the municipality level in the city organization, I would say 
it's really important to have the climate objectives in the strategy. It sounds boring, but it gives a backbone to our work. It gives us a, sort of a tool to twist people's hands when when they say that, no, we don't want to do this, it's complicated. And then we say like, well, it's in the strategy, it's one of the focal areas, so we have to do this. Second important uh, step is to have a plan. Uh, we call it a roadmap. And here the key thing is to uh, do it together. So instead of our small uh, climate team telling everyone what they should do, we went to the every single city department and unit and asked them what they could and what they would do to reduce the emissions. And this is how we created a really, really strong ownership for the, for the plan, because now all the actions in the roadmap, they came from the units, not from us. And uh, when the, the roadmap, the plan was also uh, approved in the city board, which gives it a strong political background. And for the politicians, the important part in addition to the actions was the impact evaluation. So um, to, to tell them, to show them examples of if we do these actions, how, would we, how would, will it impact the emissions? Uh, and how much will it cost? The euros are always interesting uh, for, for the politicians. Uh, and also we wanted to bring out the other benefits because most of the actions are not done because of the climate reasons. There are financial reasons, health benefits, um, city, uh, city image, well-being, so many different kinds of uh, benefits. But so far, even if we have a good plan with ownership, uh, the real question comes uh, how we're going to implement it. And I'm sure we all have enough, enough reporting and enough things to do. And that's why we wanted to use something that is already in place so that the climate work is not just a sticker that you put on top of other things, but, but instead it becomes more of something that you would do anyways. So for example, we use the city's strategic management system where all the units have to create an annual plan for the next year. And for those annual plans, all the units will look at the, the roadmap, the plan and look like, okay, these are the actions we said we would do. And then they pick some of the actions for next year's annual plan. And, and those plans are, uh, and those, um, actions are then reported three times a year and, and we're responsible of our annual plans for our, for our management. So that's how it becomes sort of mm, concrete and it stays, stays in our minds and we ensure the, the implementation. But um, this is just shortly like how we've covered the, the city organization, the municipality itself. But an important thing is obviously that we as a city organization cannot alone um, uh, achieve the climate neutrality. Uh, there is a lot of engagement that we are doing with, uh, with the citizens and with the, with the local businesses. And we use different type of uh, methods, uh, methods for the citizen engagement. And here are some, some examples of, of the services and information uh, we want to do. And we, we want to use the sort of similar logic uh, that we are using within the city organization. So instead of only our small team telling everyone what they should do, we want to engage, uh, engage with the people um, and encourage them to do accents and, and also hear from them what uh, they would like to do. So we have an um, online mobility CO2 calculator app um, where when we should just turn on and then you'll see, see what your uh, carbon footprint is when, you, when you're moving. 
We have games, uh, mobile games for, for students for information sharing. We also provide free um, energy advisory service uh, for the citizens, which is really popular uh, at the current times. Um, but we also engage the citizens with deeper dialogues. We use this uh, tool called Timeout Dialogue, which um, where you can really deep dive into a certain topic and uh, it's, it's an equal encounter in terms of that you don't become there as a development manager or a doctor or whatever. You, you forget the titles and you become there as a, as a person um, and you discuss, discuss and share the topics in a very constructive manner. Then we've done a couple of uh, runs of participatory budgeting where the, where the citizens can actually decide how they want to use a certain amount of, of money. So these are just like a handful of examples what we are doing. Um, uh, one last um, example I wanted to share with you is, uh, is a program that we are just starting uh, called Carbon Neutral Actions. And here we focus especially on citizens and businesses and especially uh, consumption, mobility, uh, behavior, and circular economy. And the goal is to enhance just equal transition to carbon neutral and climate resilient society. Because we recognize that depending on where you live uh, or, or what kind of life situation you have, your carbon neutral actions might be different. So instead of giving like general advice to, to all the citizens of Tampere, we have chosen three areas where we go to those areas and we look, okay, if you live in this area and, and, and your life situation is this or that, uh, what kind of uh, mobility or consumption habits are actually feasible and smart for you in your life situation? And we really want to engage with people and use the same um, uh, methods that we use within the city organization. We're going to ask the citizens what they could and would want to do in order to live more sustainably. sustainably. And then also bring out um, and inform them about the benefits uh, and the impacts of their actions. Uh, because I, I feel there is a lot of questions about how your actions will impact. For example, do you have to sell your car altogether and turn in and become a vegan, or would it be enough if you had vegetarian lunch, vegetarian food for lunch at work, and then used the bike or a bus three times a week, for example? So these kind of rules of thumb we really concrete uh, examples are, uh, are, the, are the goal of, of, of what we want to do in this program. So that's from my behalf, um, really shortly. Thank you for, for the opportunity to present them. And I'm, I'll, I'm online if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Uh, I, th I think it was some quite interesting examples of how you try to engage and i was impressed by the 120,000 something downloads of an app i'm just thinking on myself how often do i download new apps it's not very often um and um just i, I will so if you have you participants if you have a question or a comment please write it in the chat now we'll see if i i can catch it up uh, firstly i would like to say laura for how long time are you are you evaluating the project in some ways? I mean, the effect of the participation of the inhabitants, so to say, this part of the project. Yeah. Do you evaluate that very short how? Uh, we will have a baseline research, uh, which will start uh, this fall, where we interview people and, and we mix the interviews with like, mobility data or consumption data. So we see how, how the people are behaving now, what's their motivation and interest. And then we'll, towards the end of the program, 
we'll repeat the, the research and we'll see if there is uh, any change in, in the interest motivation and, mm. and things like that. Obviously, we cannot expect the emissions to come down with such a short, uh, a short program, but that's the, that's the long-term goal yeah. so that we can become carbon neutral by 2030. Yeah, thank you. We have a comment here from Henrik Judmanson. Uh, thank you, Laura. Do you have any support or framework for, uh, from the central government of Finland is the question. Mm. Could we stop sharing? For, uh, for Now we're just talking, so I don't sure. know if you can stop sharing. I or can if only our, see the uh, participants. Let me see if I can... Um. Oh, never mind. Oh, uh, I'll, just... I'll also try to do meanwhile when no, I'm no. answering. <laughs> Focus on the answer, please. Okay. So uh, uh, do you have any support from the central government? Um, so um, you, the main support comes from the city itself. Um, but obviously there are some funding avenues from the, from the central government when it comes to the uh, the mobility, for example, or um, or housing or things like that, but not directly, for example, for for citizen engagement. Although okay. there are like minor grants that the cities can apply for, uh, that where you get like eighty percent of grant and then twenty percent you you pay yourself and then create sort of a small project that type of grants there are uh, from the central government. Yeah, thank you. And we have uh, another question here from Charlotte Flodin. Uh, how do you assess and work with agricultural emissions? Are they part of your goals? Mm, they are, but uh, within the city of Tampere, those emissions are really small because we, we are more of an of an urban urban city, but within the the Tampere, the larger Tampere region, the the agricultural um, emissions are part uh, part of the bigger picture. But but we are in Tampere. It's not. It's such a small part that we don't have a, a strong strong focus on those. Mm -hmm. So we have a last comment here uh, from Paulina Jalonen. Uh, I have to read it. <laughs> I hope you do too, Laura. All right, it, it's more of a comment. The Climate Change Act in Finland will also have an obligation for municipalities to have a climate plan. The proposal is currently in the parliament. Thank you for that, uh, Paulina. Good to know. Uh, well, we have time for one last question, if somebody has one or a comment. And meanwhile, Laura, you can stop sharing. Yes. Focus the, only oh, on that. now I found. Yeah, they're good. It was on the <laughs> other screen. Okay. Very then. good. So, no more question or comment. Thank you very much. Um, and then I think we shall move on. I'll look at the scheme here. And uh, now we move from Finland to Sweden and Borås. Uh, moderately big municipality in the western part of Sweden, I happen to know. Uh, Frida Andersson, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello. So welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome to my home. Uh, I will share the screen with you. Just a moment. Mm -mm -mm. I've never done this in Zoom before, actually. So bear with me, please. Yeah. Uh, the trick Let's can be how you, you manage without my help. Good. We'll see if I can. Can, can you see? Do you see my home screen or do you see the presentation? We see the presentation only. Ah, oh, really good. Okay. It says it's a, it's a few persons there and it says hurry, hurry. Yes, yes, that's fair. Uh, presentation. So uh, thank you very much, Laura, for your presentation. I picked up uh, a lot of similarities to how we work in Borås. So that was really nice to hear. Uh, my name is Frida Andersson, and I work as project manager for the city of Borås and for the initiative called Klimatneutrala Borås 2030. 
uh, and I'm going to talk about our hands-on citizen dialogue that we are arranging within this initiative to spark curiosity and engagement, hopefully. Uh, so this initiative is part of the National Strategic Innovation Program <clears throat> called Viable Cities. Uh, and 23 cities in Sweden are part of this program right now. Together with five Swedish agencies, we collaborate and learn together. So we test methods and processes to reach the aim of climate neutrality in an including way. And our target groups are citizens, the municipality, politicians, companies, the academy. Everyone needs to be on board on this ship. And um, I'm going to just give you a brief background of our strategic climate work in the municipality. So we have a carbon budget and an energy and climate strategy linked to this budget. We also have a climate council, a climate committee, a shared vision of the future Borås. And we have connections with some climate networks. We even have one person in the municipality working with mobility management right now. So all the stuff is there really. Like Laura said earlier, it's so important to use this as a backbone in your work uh, when you um, hit some small rocks on your way. Um, so at the same time, there are loads to do regarding engaging our citizens, not enough. And as long as they are not on board, we won't see the snowball effect that we are after. So how do we do this? It's a massive task. That's something I feel every Sunday uh, when a new working week uh, comes. Well, uh, for about a year ago, my colleagues uh, arranged the first climate talk in Borås. And it was a citizen dialogue where citizens were encouraged to send in their questions to our politicians in advance. And during the talk, the politicians talked on stage and my colleagues did a great job arranging this, but I don't think that people felt that this was a talk on equal terms, so to speak. Uh, so when I started as project manager in February, we had a discussion. We saw the need to engage our citizens in a more including way. And since this is an innovation initiative, we have the mandate to try new things. And I've worked in the culture sector before with citizen dialogue linked to urban planning. And we've done some crazy things. We've, we've tried a hackathon in urban planning with uh, uh, young people hacking uh, as, uh, an area in the city in Minecraft. It was a lot of fun. So we have these, um, this bag full of methods that we could just try out. Uh, so we decided, let's try something else and see where it goes. And within this initiative, we have a wonderful team with engaged uh, representatives from different organizations. And one of these organizations is our local science center, Navet. And we've been working close with them for half a year now in the citizen dialogues that we have arranged. And I'm going to show you two successful talks today. Uh, the first one is this. These pictures here uh, show the event where we let two young people do a complete takeover during a climate talk in September. Isaac and Vera the two stars in the circle. Uh, this was just before the election in Sweden. And we really wanted to pinpoint the young voices in our local community. Uh, so we used already existing structures for youth influence within the municipality to do this. So Isak and Vera planned the event as a summer job. So they got paid to do this. 
and they carried out a survey all by themselves and invited young people uh, in Borås to take part of the event and they encouraged them to participate in a panel discussion. They also arranged group discussions between the youths and the politicians. And the politicians' aim was to just listen to the young voices. And they really show the politicians that young people in Borås thinks about the climate issue and they reflect upon the climate issue and young people think big. And Isak and Vera, they said after uh, this job, we really felt that our work was important and that it made a difference. Wow. And unfortunately, the run for election in Sweden then that took place until last month, um, just before, uh, just after the uh, event that I showed you, it had a negative effect on the conversation climate linked to the climate issue, especially on social media platforms. And it felt really like a push in the wrong direction for us that work with the climate issue. And it temporarily halted the tailwind in the climate work that we experienced in the, the spring. So what we did was that after the election uh, was done, there was a kind of a, an exhale in society and we arranged the climate talk then. So these pictures are taken from the city library where we held last month's climate talk. And this is a, a recurring uh, panel uh, event that we are uh, going to uh, have now. Uh, during the autumn and winter. So for this talk, we didn't invite our politicians due to the elections. They had uh, a lot of things to do. So we had this talk two weeks after the elections and this was a talk mainly for citizens. Uh, and it was based on a method called fishbowl. And it's a method where you place the panel in the middle and the audience around it, almost like the ones in the middle sits in a fishbowl. And in the outer circle, you listen. In the inner circle, you talk. And uh, we had a panel uh, consisting of a police officer, a climate activist that is friends with Greta Thunberg and two engaged citizens uh, in Borås. And the theme was help. How do we move forward? And we discussed, amongst other things, the conversation climate. Uh, and the, there was a pedagogical purpose to this, um, both the, uh, the method and why we held it two weeks after the election. Uh, they, uh, we felt that there was a need for people to talk about their feelings regarding the climate issue and the debate. Uh, and also, because of this method, we let uh, people listen and also be part of the panel discussion if they wanted to, because there was one play, um, share in the middle that was free. So uh, whoever wanted to could take place in any part of the conversation. Uh, and in the end of the talk, we let the audience decide the next theme for next month's climate talk. So this month, we are going to talk about things you can do as a citizen to reduce your emissions. And it's hard to measure the effects. Uh, we evaluate each event afterwards. But we have actually landed in that perhaps it is the stomach feeling that decides if it was a good talk or not. And these two examples, our stomach feelings afterwards was so warm and there was almost like an, an, an environmental shift in the air in the room. And I think that is a ticket uh, of success. And my experience is when people feel listened to, 
that's where the magic really begins. And I've worked with citizen dialogue since 2019. And I think that collaborative citizen dialogues are the best. And I would be happy to share the fishbowl method with you. Just send me an email and I will send you some information. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. <clears throat> thank you, Frida. Uh, so if you stop sharing, well, thank you. Uh, I think you gave us some very concrete advices how to create and manage the dialogue. Uh, and I've been working with environmental issues for roughly 30 years. And I think that people like me who are natural scientists or something similar, maybe city planners or so, we are better, better at um, admi administrating plans than administrating dialogue because that's not a part of our education anyway. So uh, I think this is a growing topic, uh, which you have given some example of. So that was my reflections. Let's see if we have, uh, if you have a chat uh, question or comment, please write it now. Uh, to Frida, I mean. Henrik Judmason, uh, how are the cities helping each other? Uh, we could talk about cities in West Sweden or whatever. Oh, no, rather uh, in the collaboration you mentioned uh, yeah. in your start, perhaps. So we have um, uh, a learning space within the initiative and the program nationally. We meet each week at uh, breakfasts. So I get to meet the other project managers in the cities. And we also have a learning space together where we collaborate with methods and we share a lot of experiences. So how have you been working in your city with this issue? And it's really nice to have that, um, to have that space. We also talk with the agencies. Uh, so uh, we, we talk with the program leaders for the Viable Cities program, and that's really helpful. And now you mentioned um, uh, the name is Viable Cities, if somebody wants to go Google it. And um, Annika, I think we, we will uh, certainly distribute the presentations afterwards, I suppose. Uh, otherwise, you will protest. So you will have uh, the, the information there. Uh, let's see, the time is now. We have one short comment here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because the time is running out. So I will give you one more minute uh, from Johanna. Oops, now it's rolling in. I can't, we can't give time for all this. Maybe you can ask her afterwards. But Johanna, uh, how can the input from citizen dialogues be more, oops, be more visible in the urban planning from walk to talk? How do you go from walk to talk, so to say, uh, when the, the dialogues be more visible in the urban planning? I'm not uh, sure that I understand the question. Okay, well, that, you... then we, if you don't get it right away, we, can, we just drop it. I can. How, how do you include? Uh, how do you include the input in the urban planning? I mean, mm. there are more projects like yours, um, but it's always um, directed towards youth, for example. But then you see the urban planning goes on as always. Um, priority for um, middle-aged men's travel behavior, for example. So what do you do with the results that you get from these dialogues? Are they included in the actual urban planning from talk to walk, I meant? Okay, thank you. Well, uh, we have um, different, we are actually right now in a very, uh, experimental stage of um, we are uh, developing new guidelines for citizen influence in Borås and uh, this is something that I raise my hand always to stress the importance of 
uh, taking in people's citizens' ideas in earlier stages in urban planning and throughout the whole process. So uh, I think it's about uh, it's about uh, communication, how you communicate. Where can you, as a citizen, uh, come with your influence and your ideas, and how do we take this into the urban planning? Um, and there are many methods of how you can work with this. And um, I think there's a discussion nationally in Sweden right now, because uh, a lot of cities face uh, the challenge where we have these complex issues like climate change, and we really need to have input from citizens, but we have a squared system that doesn't let us bring in um, citizens ideas. I don't know if I gave you a good answer, but that was just my thoughts. Thank you, Freda. It was uh, some short reflections on a big question, really, that we got from Johanna. So, um, Freda, we thank you and uh, move on to Hanne Norli. Are you here? I'm here. Yes, thank you. You are from Norway and please introduce yourself and feel free to the floor is yours in roughly 10 thank minutes. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can. Oh, perfect. Uh, yes, my name is, uh, first, first of all, thank you for those two previous presenters for very concrete examples. My name is Hanna Norli and um, uh, I do not represent the municipality or a regional authority. Uh, I work for, since yesterday, actually, for the consulting company of uh, Asplan Viak, but I have for the past 11 years worked in respectively the uh, public transport authority in the Oslo region and for the national rail authority uh, in Norway. Uh, and in those two jobs, I have been dealing with uh, the topic that uh, I will give a little presentation of. And so my presentation will probably be a little bit more uh, from an overall perspective. Uh, I will talk about the zero growth goal uh, that uh, is uh, valid for the, the four largest cities in Norway and for the urban growth agreements that are linked to this goal. And then I will talk uh, more specifically about public transport and sustainable mobility solutions and how the, uh, the, uh, the regions and the municipalities are working in these cities uh, to get a as I say, uh, the public literally on board on these sustainable solutions. Uh, and I will try to, to uh, get into how, how uh, we actually get the, the public aboard. Uh, the zero growth uh, goal for the major cities in Norway has actually been uh, picked up by OECD as uh, one of the 10 uh, uh, great ways of uh, reaching, uh, reaching climate goals. And uh, just a short description of what this actually is. Many of you might already know this, but just a short description. Um, the whole uh, goal is uh, that the growth in passenger transport in these four big cities shall be absorbed by public transport, cycling and walking. And the goal has been valid since 2012. So it's actually 10 years old now. And it's actually a very ambitious goal. Uh, because these cities are they are growing. Uh, the, uh, the goal is valid for the Oslo region, the Bergen region and Trondheim and Stavanger. And these cities are growing. So when you have the population growth, when you have, have had at least uh, economic growth <laughs> up until now, uh, and you keep the private car traffic at the standstill, it's actually a very ambitious goal in terms of getting people to move themselves by more sustainable modes. And these are complex uh, agreements. There are different measures. Uh, we talk about both land use, uh, where the municipalities are in charge, densification and, uh, and land use around public transport nodes. There is a big investment uh, package in terms of investing in public transportation and other sustainable modes, biking and, uh, and uh, walking uh, routes. And of course, there is parking policies and other pricing mechanisms that are more of the restrictive uh, measures. 
And the financing is also therefore a mix of state funds from the, from the national government and the regional funds. And of course, uh, the tolls are also used as, uh, the toll revenues are also used as uh, financing for these packages. I'm going to talk about uh, Oslo and a little bit about Trondheim because these are the cities that I know best and these, these are actually the cities that have had uh, the greatest success uh, in, in this matter. And when you look at Oslo, uh, this, uh, many of these cities had sort of environmental packages also before the, uh, the national urban growth agreements were established. So from uh, 2008, uh, the, uh, the, the region of Oslo and Akershus have had a lot of investments going into public transportation. And they have actually, in fact, managed up until 2019. I have to stress that all this is before COVID because we all know that after COVID, things are change, changing rapidly. But up until before COVID, the growth in uh, private traffic in the Oslo region have actually been taken by public transportation, walking and biking. And this graph only shows the public transportation related to the population growth and related to the growth in, in private car traffic. And they have actually managed to, to keep the, the, uh, the private car traffic at a standstill, which is it's, 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 it's a great result when you see uh, how much the city region has actually grown in population. And, uh, and, and the, the reason for this uh, has a lot to do about financing, naturally. Uh, the, um, the Oslo package, the Oslo financing package has uh, in the last year spent almost, almost 90% of the financing has been spent on public transportation, walking and biking. And when you know that the revenues are coming from, to a large extent, from the car drivers to the, uh, through the toll revenues, uh, you could imagine that the car drivers or the public would be uh, uh, not supportive of this, but they have actually been supportive. Uh, and the toll revenue company is measuring the, uh, the acceptance of the public every year. And they have seen that uh, the acceptance has actually been stronger over the years. It had a small dip uh, right prior to COVID, but uh, the acceptance has been strong among the whole public. And the reason for that is that everybody sees that this actually works for everyone. So when more people uh, let their car park in their garage in the morning, it's better for those who travel by the uh, quite extensive public transport system. It's better for those who are biking, but it's also better for those who, who still need to take their car because they have more space <laughs> in the roads. So everybody sees that this is actually working. Uh, but the second thing that has been done is that through the public transport authority and the company that was also established in 2008, they have had an extensive uh, customer focus all along. Uh, they have uh, had dialogues, as we've heard of here. They have had, uh, of course, they do a lot of customer surveys. They engage with their customers not only when it comes to new technological devices such as mobile ticketing and, uh, and those kinds of, uh, of offers, but also when it comes to the actual route planning and where people want to travel. Uh, and Router is still taking this customer orientation to a next level now that we are in a situation where there is more flexibility, more uh, micro mobility, uh, other solutions coming to the market. Uh, I believe that this is one of the core reasons that, uh, that these uh, qu quite radical uh, policies have had, had such a great. <laughs> Hanna, Hanna, do you hear me? Hanna, uh, there is something very strange with your um, with the sound right now. Uh, you, I don't think you did anything. It was maybe just a asteroid cloud passing in the in the atmosphere somewhere. Try again, please. No, we lost we lost your sound in some strange way. Um, 
It was in the middle of a sentence, so I don't think you actually did anything. I think it's something technically boring. <laughs> um, try again, see if, if we can hear you. Oh, it sounds awful. Um, what do we do? Can we try without the headset, maybe. Yeah, could you try without the headset? <laughs> Just pull the pull it out so it's not connected anymore, and we'll see if you if we can hear you in any way. No, no. Okay. It's still not good. Yeah, yeah. Now. Oh, is it better? <laughs> Continue this way, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I was talking about route to the Public Transport Authority and what Oslo, the city of Oslo is actually has actually done for the past years is also to ramp up the strategies for biking and walking. And the city always had strategies for biking and walking, but it has been, I would say, not more aggressive, but more, uh, has, they have been put, they put more energy into actually developing uh, more bike lanes for, especially for bikers and also working on the car-free city center uh, over the last years. Uh, Briefly about Trondheim, which is another city who has had great results even prior to the urban growth agreements. What, what Trondheim has had a success in is actually to, to, uh, to show and tell the public, not only engage with the public, but show and tell that what they're actually, uh, what, what the money to this, uh, what they call milieu pack and the city pack package is actually being used for. So this is what your money is being used for. And uh, if you want to walk, this is also what your money has been used for. And you can see that uh, there is now 15 minutes to walk from where you are to your destination, for example. So it's a very concrete way of actually showing the public and the customers that, uh, well, we put a lot of money into this and the car drivers are paying quite a lot of it, but this is actually the result that you're getting. Um, of course, we all know that in some cases this does not work, uh, and obviously the picture to the right here is from, from France, but we did have, uh, prior to the last, last uh, municipal and regional elections, we had quite an outrage also in the Nor Norwegian cities. Uh, there was an outrage uh, towards the, the toll rings and the, the fact that car drivers would have to pay for, uh, for all these uh, nice public transport and walking and biking projects. Uh, and in the cities of Stavanger and Bergen, uh, it, it got to that uh, extent that uh, it actually affected the elections quite a lot. So we've had new parties, single case, single cause parties that took a lot of the votes and it made it a little bit difficult <laughs> in, in those cities because uh, single party, uh, single case parties is not always that easy to get into, uh, into parliaments, into city parliaments. Uh, and I believe that one of the reasons that this was so difficult, especially in the Stavanger region, is basically because they did the customers or the public didn't really see what benefits they got out of all this money that was put into projects because the projects were not really ready. So I think, uh, again, if you show the customers that we have projects, this will work for you, it will work for those who uh, choose to travel sustainably and it will also work for those who still need to use your car then you don't get into these struggles but all the cities had this sort of movement and I guess it was also affected by what happened in France and other places. So now as I said initially we are in a situation we all know where there is a lot of change going on uh, the cars are being electrified in a larger extent we have micro mobility maybe we will have self-driving cars and after the pandemic, the travel habits have been changing a lot and what is the future? Uh, and people are asking themselves, do we need to, uh, can we just throw away our former goal? Do we need the zero growth goal anymore? Can, or is the problem solved? Of course it is not solved. Uh, and, uh, and our analysis shows that uh, much of this, what we have been working on for the last 10, 20, 30 years is still valid. You need to, you need to have your customer orientation at the bottom. You need to listen to your public. 
you need to have, of course, one eye on the environmental goals, whether it has to do uh, about climate uh, uh, neutrality, uh, carbon neutrality, or whether it has to do about local environmental issues or about land use uh, densification. And of course, the more for the money goal is increasingly important, and especially these days when everybody's basically getting poorer, both governments and, and people. So uh, the zero growth goal, uh, we believe, is still highly valid. Uh, make sure that people don't need to drive their private cars. It's still a very important target uh, in the larger cities, but also increasingly in smaller cities and regions. So my, my summarized goals from this sort of bird eye, bird's eye perspective is that uh, if you want to have success, you have to start by establishing common goals across both political levels lines, as they've had great success with in Oslo and also in Trondheim, but also across administrative lines, state, regional and municipal levels. Make it simple. A zero growth goal is very simple and it's easy to communicate. And then you need to know your customer and your population. And that's where the responsibility of the uh, municipal, municipal authorities, but also the regional authorities who are in charge of public transport, you need to know your customers. And uh, try <laughs> to implement solutions or the carrots before you implement the restrictions, or at least at the same time. And if you show and tell, uh, people get more enthusiastic about what you're actually doing. Thank you, and sorry about these technical problems. Oh, well, no problem. Thank you, uh, Hannek. So if you stop sharing. Yeah, I will uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Yes. I think you talked about something very important. Uh, well, you all do, but th this thing we have seen in Göteborg, uh, in Sweden also, that the, the question of acceptance on bigger changes uh, there we we introduced a uh, road charging system uh, congestion charges and uh, there is always a risk for resistance to the changes which you don't find profitable for yourself uh, and you have talked about ways of meeting that by communicating but also showing what is good for you uh, or trying to show it at least so that is very that that i think we will meet now and then you you take a step backwards again as you mentioned maybe that mm -hmm. will happen and you will you you should be prepared for that yeah. um that was my reflection let's see if we have a question for you from some of the participants here you can write your short note or question in the chat Henrik Gudmundsson uh, in Oslo, is micromobility integrated in the router system like uh, travel planner or so on or um, do you need yeah. different apps for each device? It's it's a bit uh, not spot on on the subject. So it's short answer on that. Yeah, no, no, it's a, a short answer. Not yet. Uh, they are trying it in one of the neighbor communities, uh, but not not yet. Right. <laughs> no, no problem, <laughs> Henrik. It's just mm. to keep focus. Um, mm. Right. Short and good answer. Thank you. We have time for one more comment or question. Okay, uh, Hanna, when you started here, you said we have technical problems then, and you said that you used the Swedish solution, and that was to finish <laughs> everything and start again, and you used it again, you just plug everything out, and then it worked. <laughs> the restart, the Swedish button. <laughs> yeah, the, the Swedish re button. The funny thing is, we have very similar things in Sweden, but they yeah. are Norwegian, these buttons. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, you know that. Yeah. Well, thank you. And now you. I propose, thank you, Hannah. Uh, and I propose we take five minute breaks. So we meet here at one minute past 10 again, just to, to keep the breath and uh, do something else for four minutes. So welcome back. Hope you're back. Yeah. So now I hope you're back and the recording has started again. Um, first of all, I want to ask, we don't happen to have Martin Vestergaard from Denmark here, do we? We haven't seen you connected. 
no uh, and to all your others this should be it should be a presentation from denmark now but martin is not he has not connected so we don't know why unfortunately so we move on to um, iceland instead i just wanted to check whether he is maybe showed up recently and now so we go to uh, iceland uh, and the mobility change challenges in reykjavik and run oh sorry rafnotir you better pronounce your name yourself we are so bad at this we swedes but uh, you're very welcome and the floor is yours uh, thank you <clears throat> and good morning um, my name is ran rapsdotter it's very hard to pronounce <clears throat> but uh, usually i'm called run in in uh, where well when i'm uh, people are talking to me in other languages uh, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you, uh, I'm from Reykjavik city and talking on behalf of the municipality and I will tell you about the climate action plan that we have and how is this related to uh, transport uh, and where the main challenges is actually within Reykjavik and maybe the large uh, greater Reykjavik area. So let's see if I can share this. Yes, this is our. How we can, can see the presentation, but it's not in presenter mode. If you want okay. to do it, it's not necessary, but uh, you could try to change it if you want. Is this better? Well, no, it's the same. Uh, no, you can click yeah. on F5. You, you don't see the presentation or is it not in presentation mode? No, it's not in presentation mode. Um, you could use uh, F5 or below um, in the PowerPoint. There's also presentation mode. Um, it's not yet in the presentation mode. No. No. I did use F5, so this is just some kind of, it should just continue. Yeah, we, we see we see it anyway. It's just- Can you see the slide? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We yeah, do. yeah, okay, great. Well, <clears throat> this is the most uh, recent climate action plan that we have. But, was, sorry, uh, sorry. No. Um, but when you when you move to the next picture, you should have to use the, the uh, left pane there uh, and choose between pictures. It, Otherwise, we won't see if you change pictures. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. I'm just starting to talk about this first slide. Because we had the recent climate action plan that was made in 2021, or accepted in 2021. And we had uh, a lot of participation to have an input about the climate actions at that time. I did uh, advertisements and reached out to the public in that way and meetings and so on. And uh, because Iceland is, uh, well, a small populated country, it can be an easy way to reach to a lot of habitants that way, just through, just a short about the Reykjavik. I don't know if you are familiar with it here up in the north, but we are about 135,000 inhabitants. And uh, well, we have geothermal heat and hydro, so the electricity and housing does not have uh, uh, the largest part of CO2 emissions like it is in many other countries. But our main challenge is actually due to uh, fossil fuel transport, the most by the private car. So the focus has been there actually. And our goal is to be, or a vision, to be carbon neutral by 2040. But then we just recently uh, have been se selected to be a part of the EU mission cities and to enhance that goal to be carbon neutral by 2030. So that is a project that will be going on for the 
next years. But this is the goal as it is today. And what we... Uh, Ren? Yeah? May I ask you, are you still at the first picture? Because we still see the first one. I think you okay. have moved. Because I think so, you have double... I think you see the presentation mode, but we don't. So you have to change it. Maybe if you close the presentation mode, if you have that one open as well. I just stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> try that one. We, we try the Swedish button. Start again. Right. You this see the better. first one now. Yeah, we see the first one. And if you... And do you see the second one now? Or... Yes. Thank you. Okay. I just needed this to <laughs> really share it. Yes, this is what I was talking about. It's uh, just to get uh, the knowledge of the city. Uh, that the main challenges of Reykjavik is the transport by private car and the fossil fuel uh, private car emissions. And here was about the vision of about 2040, but here is what I wanted to show you. I know that this is maybe uh, a little bit of a crowded slide, but the emphasis is on the statistics actually. And uh, what we really try to do is to show how huge part the transportation is of the climate goals that we have to look into. That is, uh, even if you calculate it in a different kind of ways and include all kinds of emissions, then transport is always the largest share of emissions within the city. So, and actually this sometimes comes to as a surprise to people when I talk to them and uh, this is something that we have to uh, show even further on. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the <coughs> action plan as well, uh, because the, how can you say, it? the transportation is a part of uh, uh, the challenges are in a, such a, a broad spectrum. Uh, we are focusing on making the city more walkable. It is a, a quite sprawl city that was, uh, planned around the private car back in the 1970s. So we have like a suburbs where people drive from and to work and, and have to use the car a lot. So the focus has been on planning, on making the city more walkable, but also on energy exchange of cars and public transport and so on. And <clears throat> then the focus has been on health enhancing uh, travel modes, and then we're looking at public transport. So these are the main sec six actions <clears throat> that we're looking into in the Climate Action Plan, and three of them are focused on, on transport. So the different kinds of approaches that we have on including uh, this into the Action Plan. So actually, this is what uh, the focus is on. It is on the 50-minute district that uh, is growing uh, in other cities as well but also on green city development. It is a part of development of the city and of the energy exchange and to be a world-class bicycling city. Uh, that has been going on for like uh, 10 years, but has been growing and, uh, uh, and we have a wider bicycling net uh, just within the city. Uh, but then is the infrastructure also for uh, Borgalina or the improved public transportation system. And how can you say it? Actually, uh, when I was thinking about uh, this presentation and what the role of the municipalities are, then the role is to make the infrastructure for people to make the change. And as we have uh, transport as a hugest uh, challenge right now, this is our main focus on uh, how can you say, change in the travel modes or make it easier for people to not use the car, but also, uh, yeah, in a, all kinds of a different kind of levels within the city. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how we have been asking people how they uh, travel to and from work. 
because actually there is some opportunity there. And we have been asking about this for uh, some years. And as you see, the main majority is <clears throat> using the car both as a driver or as a passenger. And uh, actually the numbers of bicycling have been rising for the for the last years because the, the proportion were just about 0.2% for like 20 years ago. So this has been growing and also uh, for a growing city. Uh, but then it was decided to ask, okay, uh, how would you like to go to work if you know there were no limits? And that was quite learningful actually, because there you see that the minority would like to use the car as driver. And we have a much larger proportion that would like to go by bicycle or walking and by bus and so on. So how can you say that? this was a, a pleasant uh, solutions that we had there, but it also, uh, how can you say that the strength and the position that we had on, on continuing uh, uh, building infrastructure for the, uh, for the uh, changes of travel modes and, and bicycling and so on. So just for a comparison, you'll see uh, how the numbers are. Uh, there is a there is a huge difference between how can you say it, the proportion of uh, the people that usually go by car as a driver are, are around seventy five percent, but uh, less than fifty percent would like to go by car if they had another. Uh, opportunities to do this. So this is, uh, how can you say it, a kind of way that <clears throat> we can uh, do to uh, see what uh, people are thinking and and keep on or, or change the strategy according to that one. But uh, how can you say it, um, actually uh, those kind of uh, involving the public, it is of course a part of the of the uh, planning process to have uh, the public uh, involved in into the uh, certain projects and planning and so on. So we have been working on that as well, but also have making experiments within the city to make it obvious uh, what kind of place the public or the car is taking in the uh, in just in the city. So this has been a focus to change parking spaces into uh, some more kind of fun areas. And this has been working with the private sector as well, uh, that uh, people can have an area or a parking lot uh, by their store or shop and so on, uh, or restaurant to have something fun instead of a parking lot uh, in front of it. And I also wanted to mention that uh, this summer we had a competition on, on making uh, plots like this. And uh, the focus was on carbon neutrality and biodiversity as well. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that, but that can also be an idea. If you're having some kind of uh, planning projects or fun projects going on within the city uh, to connect the discussion of carbon neutrality with it as well. So it goes into combination with other things that we're doing. And just another example, this is a, a square within downtown Reykjavik and uh, this was a parking lot. Uh, we had experiments for some years, actually, after the crisis back in 2008, and uh, there were different kinds of competitions to make this parking lot into a fun field in the summertime. And then it was changed back into parking lot uh, in the wintertime. But finally, this made the ground for making a square uh, for people just uh, in general. So this is how it uh, is uh, looking today in a great summer uh, day. Uh, so maybe what I wanted to show with this is that uh, we are trying to combine the climate actions with the projects that are going on within the city in general. And uh, how can you say it? To, uh, to make it visible for people, uh, the place the car is taking in, in the city 
but also how building an infrastructure or making it easier to people to travel within the city without having to use the car. Uh, because this is the situation, we are expecting a growth of 70,000 people within the Reykjavik Korea, and that means around 90 people per week, and it's very important that we don't have 90 cars uh, expanding into the streets each week, but uh, that the focus will be on the infrastructure that we can have all these people into the uh, Reykjavik Korea and traveling with a different mode than just the private car. So this was just a quick overview of, of the climate action plan with the Reykjavik and, and how we're trying to combine uh, the public uh, into common procedures around the planning. Thank you, Ren. Uh, so maybe you stop sharing now. Uh, and I think you said uh, to, th th it was very interesting, this survey you mentioned, how would you like to travel? And you compare that with uh, the actual travel pattern at the moment. And that is, uh, it's, it's important for policy, local policymakers to know there is an acceptance or uh, demand for these invest investigations, which you talked about the, the role of infrastructure investments, which are really the one and only instrument, which is the most single most important instrument to reach the goal, so to say, in this perspective. So that was very interesting to hear. We had some technical problems and by um, and since it was like that, we heard you and saw this very good, uh, finally, but uh, I will I will not let any questions or comments just not to. So we move on to the next uh next person here so thank you very much Ben. thank you um now uh henry Klo, you are working just as me at the swedish environmental research institute and you will talk about some psychological aspects of policy instruments what we've talked about today so the floor is yours so <laughs> try to share my screen or my presentation uh, can you see it now? Yes, we see it not in presenter mode, but the yeah, this is presenter mode. Great. And uh, um, first, I will say we we uh, we had questions for Run. We have a thank thank you, Run, and then some questions. You you have to address her uh, afterwards or lately, but we haven't got the time now. Sorry for that. So Henrik, move on. Okay, uh, maybe I just mentioned that Morton hasn't turned up. Uh, I, we got some information that he was out of office. What's a pity, but I can I can send a link to one of the things that he had done, so you can just get a glimpse of, of what, what you missed, so to say. Um, uh, it, it was about engagement to uh, to create new energy production in the, in the municipality, in a small municipality in Denmark. Okay, uh, this is a crash course in environmental psychology. <laughs> I will try to, to do it in 10 minutes. Uh, this gives a little bit of theoretical background and I, I've been listening to all this presentation and I think, well, that's exactly the model of, of planned behavior. And this is the greed efficiency uh, fairness model and so on. So I will give you a little glimpse of that. First of all, so environmental psychology, it's, it's a part of the social psychology area within the, the uh, the psychology discipline. You can interpret it in two ways, either like how is environment affecting your, psych your psychological status? I mean, it's nice to be in the forest, for example, but in this content, it's more about how to react to the environmental challenges uh, as human beings. And, and uh, so the topics are attitudes, how attitudes become behaviors uh, and how habits, decision-making, how to intervene, to, to change behaviors and also to create acceptance or efficiency of policy implementation. And I start off with the first psychological model called theory of planned behavior. It's about how, how to first create an attitude towards a new behavior and, what, and that, that this is really a multi-step process. First of all, you have to have this cognitive process that means that you have to realize by your intellectual that this is important. And you also need to feel it effective 
And it also has to match a little bit with your behavior. Like if you are a person that always takes a bike, you you are very much at it, good positive attitudes to take the bike to work. If you are a person who drives a car, that is more than, than that's the attitude you normally have then. Uh, anyway, if you're created this attitude through these processes, you also need to feel the norms around you in the society. We are now on the yellow part of this picture and also have a perceived control. I mean, that's basically that you can do it. I mean, you can take the bicycle instead of the car, for example, it's possible. Then you can maybe end up in intention to do it. And as we all know, good intentions don't always become good behaviors. <clears throat> and the trick here is to have a sort of slow step from intention to behavior and, and often to, to, to uh, face the situation as it is. I mean. Not that I will take bus next week. I will do it today. And today is the, the, the day to do it. And that leads us into to, uh, uh, how decisions are made a little bit. And that's another model here called elaboration likelihood model. And that is, there are two ways really to take decisions. One is what we call the upper, upper part here, the high ability and motivation. That is when you really go deep into the, 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 the issue and think about pros and cons and so on, and you use sort of your central mind to, to, to come to a decision. But as we know, we cannot go on like that for, for every small decision we make. So normally we, <clears throat> for small decisions, we go the low ability. I mean, taking what just feels right and what's what's uh, in front of your, your, your eyes, so to say. And that is really sort of the uh, background to this nudging uh, idea. I mean, it must be easy to do the right thing because you don't always can think about it in a, in a deeper and a more intellectual way for every decision you do during a day. Um, and then another thing is the cognitive dissonance theory. That is when you feel that your your behavior is actually in conflict with your attitudes and values. Uh, I mean, you think of yourself as, as a as, as a good person that, <clears throat> that really behaves in a way, and you see that that is that is not the the the, the thing that you see. I mean, uh, many people say that they like to buy ecological, ecological uh, food, for example, but when you look at the uh, sales figures, that's not that's a very big gap between how many that say that they are, they are doing it and how many, how much they are actually selling. So that can be a, a conflict. With it, and uh, there are a number of things, ways to deal with that. You can change your behavior, but you can also do it by changing your attitude or changing the perception of what it's about. I mean, if you <clears throat> I eat vegetable once one day in a week, you can maybe imagine that you're a person that often eats vegetable food, for example. Uh, but in, in fact, you only do it once once in a week. You can also change the the importance of the conflict, or you can also as you know, as we all know, we are very good at uh, having ways to uh, to to, to uh, excuse our behaviors. <laughs> we are very in, um, we're, you know, very innovative when it comes to find out excuses. Um, so when it comes to intervention strategies, some conclusions from the science is that there are there are ways that works, but and one important thing is just information is usually not sufficient. Uh, so that's, that's an important step. You have to inform people that something is important, but that doesn't mean that they actually act to it. Uh, and the closer you get to the actual behavior, the more efficient it is. Uh, I took the example of nudging, for example, uh, that you can sort of take the decision at the same time as you are pursuing your behavior. Um, and also, if it's more, more and more adapted to the ability of the person. I mean, if you don't, if there are no good cycle lanes, you don't get people to, to use the cycle, even if they wanted to. Or even. So, and then this, and, and this last bullet point here, I think it's, it was something I heard when I when I listened to Norway here about that you really need to keep on the target all the time because the effect may not be sustainable over time. Uh, I have this picture here, it's this poor boy, and, and it's probably a, a matter of climate change. But 
unfortunately, this kind of methods might not be very efficient because first of all, it's just an information. And the second thing is too far away from you, from your, your decision in your life. And it's not really adapted to your ability. That means what, what, can I, what should I do about this? Uh, you cannot do anything about this specific problem. Of course, you can do your part when it comes to, to your climate footprint, but uh, this is a, a kind of information that might be difficult to, to uh, turn into behavior. Uh, when it comes to policy implementation, there is also some steps. Uh, with, there is a, change, a difference between acceptability and, and really getting acceptance. For example, if you are going to put up a windmill farm, many people are in principle positive to renewable energy, could be, but when it comes to, to the concrete plants, they are starting to be more reluctant. They maybe think it's ugly or whatever. So then how to overcome that is to do some kind of dialogue, do some way of, of having an intelligent implementation, maybe have a long period of dialogues, maybe test a demonstration or, or something like that to visualize what's it all about. And then people might feel afterwards that, well, it was actually rather good or it was at least acceptable. So uh, for example, uh, the, the implementation of the road user charge in Stockholm when they had a, a, an experimental period for a while and people found out that it, is, it was actually efficient and then they, they got a positive answer in, in the election afterwards. They had a sort of referendum if they would introduce this. In Gothenburg, they didn't do that. And, and here we had a lot of resistance against our uh, road user charge. So, so the implementation phase has to be sort of intelligent in that sense. Then it can maybe be, be tempted to use in economic incentives, and that can be uh, encouraging. It's feeling like an extra bonus. We call it crowding in, but it can also be a little bit dangerous because that can be such that you are questioning the intrinsic, intrinsic motivation of people. And then, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, then it be more replaced to a business mind. So if you say that uh, you get this uh, this amount of money for 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 accepting something, then it might be said, well, this was too little. <laughs> it's, it becomes not 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 a, a motivating things anymore. It becomes more of, of sort of a, a business, and that has been a problem in some cases. Uh, the last theory I would like to mention, and I have I think I even don't really need to do it, but of course, we have heard so many examples of this uh, this morning, but uh, it can be interesting to say that it actually is supported by a, a, a theory in, in literature by Bilke and from 1991, it's called the greed efficiency of fairness theory. So for example, with the, the, the Norwegian tolls using uh, the, 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 the theory of growth target in, in Oslo, Everybody who pays for it, of course, is not very keen on paying it, but they noticed that it was efficient. Efficient. They actually changed the, the traffic situation. And even those people that had to use the car found out that, uh, that the, the, the roads were not was less crowded. So here the greed was balanced by efficiency. Um, maybe, <clears throat> uh, uh, and the same mistake or problem in, in, in Stavanger then that People didn't see the immediate effect of, of their um, effort when it comes to paying, then, then they, there was a problem with the implementation. So greed efficiency need to be balanced, but also fairness. I mean, there must not be any free riders. People with company cars must not must also pay, for example. Uh, or there must not be any, any losers that there is that people read about in the paper or or, or, or feel that this, this was not a fair uh, policy. So this, I think this theory is, is very interesting to have in mind. And uh, so it's a balance between individual consequences, community consequences, and the perception of justice, greed, efficiency, fairness. We, we did a study uh, at IVL on parking uh, policies 
And in that study, we also asked a number of, of people in the communities in Sweden about different policy instruments within the area of mobility. And we placed them on a two axes. Are they accepted for this policy or, an, or do they feel that that policy instrument is efficient? So uh, first, the red ones are about parking. And here we have higher fees, less parking place, on, and, the, and a concept called parking levy, which is a sort of a tax for parking. And they feel that everything that intervened with parking has a good efficiency, but low acceptance, at least in the, in the, in, in the first step. Uh, when it comes to public transport, there was up in the, the upper right corner, and it, they, were, they were considered efficient for mobility but and also accept it. Um, people like to have cheaper <laughs> public transport and better public transport, naturally. Uh, when it comes to road issues, like uh, road usage charge is about the same thing. So it's the F there in the, in the upper left corner, but also an interesting, uh, idea, an interesting uh, conclusion is that investment in road infrastructure has high acceptance, but low efficiency according to these uh, these uh, people in the, in, in the Swedish communities. Then there was a number of other, other uh, policy instruments and measures that, that was a little bit spread out, like uh, measures for walking and cycling, high, high acceptance and high efficiency, um, working at home, same thing, commuter, commuter parking also up in the, that corner, car sharing a little bit more doubtful, but um, something like that. Okay, I think uh, that was my last slide. Um, so this was a very brief crash course in environmental psychology. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Henrik. So if you stop sharing, sure. uh, what you, you, I should say, but that was obvious, I think for most of us that you are a part of this project, you've been working with it. And the idea of talking some minutes about this is these are some fundamentals you have to take into uh, account when you plan your actions mm -hmm. and that is very important so um, thank you for that now we have um, uh, approximately 25 minutes now and uh, we are moving on to the next part of the webinar which is a possibility for you to share your experiences and listen to others in uh, group rooms. Uh, my colleagues who are governing this webinar, they will soon send you out in different group rooms. We have one discussion leader from uh, the team in each group room. And the discussion leader will, in the chat, send you three questions. You will not have time to tell everybody else what you think about three questions because we are too many uh, so you have three questions choose one of them and think of a short reflection or answer and the uh, we will um, we will give you 15 minutes from now so um, to um, to discuss in a group room and then we gather together here and we will have a short sum up from the discussion leader what you said in each group. Uh, have I said everything? Anita? Um, uh, no, what time should we be back from the yeah. room? Because we Fif can't communicate with you. No, no, 15 minutes. That is uh, 10, 10 to 11. Okay, yes. Yeah. So everything is okay? Anika, shall we send us out? Uh, yes, Sita is sending everybody who is left in the meeting to different rooms. Yeah, good. Yes. See you uh, 10 to 11. Yes. Um...